Hi, TDF fans. My name is Katie Rose Clark. And, and I'm Reg Rogers. And we Hello. are in Merrily We Roll Along on Broadway. I play Beth Shepard. I play Franklin Shepard's first wife. Yeah, and I play Joe, a theater producer who also happens to be another student. And I am sitting in my bedroom. I'm wearing a dark jacket. I'm wearing glasses. And I have the, the clutter of my uh, bedroom behind me. I am also in my apartment. I have, um, I'm in my apartment in the living room. My son is watching Spider-Man and I'm wearing glasses and a blue sweater. So welcome to my living room. <laughs> so um, here's the first question, Reg. Are you ready just to kick this off? I'm ready. Give it. Thanks for, thanks for being with me today, Reg. I appreciate thanks it. Thanks for asking me. Always. I love talking. Uh, you're one of my favorite people to talk to. <laughs> um, okay, Reg, this is a perfect question for you. Yes. <laughs> Are you a longtime Sondheim fan, and were you familiar with Marilee before you joined the cast? I am not. I'm shaking my head. I'm not <laughs> a longtime Sondheim fan. I'm not a longtime musical theater uh, person, really. Mm -hmm. I, I did... Isn't Follies Sondheim? Mm -hmm. I did when I was in college audition for a guy who apparently in Follies walks in and says, I keep my hand in, I keep working. And that's his whole, that's his line. That's all you did. And that's all I did. And I didn't get it. <laughs> but uh, mm -hmm. I, I, I'm not a long time. I, I don't know uh, Sondheim very well. Mm -hmm. And, uh, uh, and I didn't know it before I joined the cast and I really wanted, I didn't really listen to it before I joined the cast because I wanted your voices to be the voices in my head. And oh. I'm really glad I did that. I love that. I am similar. I did. I didn't know Marilee. I am a longtime Sondheim fan and I have auditioned for many different Sondheim productions and have never gotten cast in any of them. And even in college, we did company in college. I auditioned for a regional, and when I was in college, a regional production of Little Night Music. I didn't get it. I've, I've auditioned for many different productions of- That's Inter him too. God, yeah. He's, he's done a lot. Yes. So I've auditioned for many Sondheim shows, but this is the first one I've actually booked, which is amazing. Congratulations. Um, Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Feels good. So I, but I didn't know Merrily. This was one of the shows that I wasn't as familiar with. I knew some of the songs from it and I have sung a couple of the songs like in cabaret type settings. Um, but this is, I'm so glad that I kind of came in fresh with it because of, you know, the history of the show is that this is kind of, this was his flop back in, you know, 81 or what was it? 81. I think so. Yeah. Uh, when it originally opened. That's my husband, Chris, back there. <laughs> just walking up. Everybody's waking up from naps. Chris is working from home. Um, so anyway, I, I love that I came into this production of Merrily sort of fresh and without kind of a, being aware of the history or having really any, uh, I guess, baggage of what that was before. And I, all I know really is this iteration of it. Yeah. So... Uh I think that you, you touched on the next question. Oh, did I? Yeah. Okay, here it is. The current Broadway production of Merrily We Roll Along counts as one of Sondheim's biggest hits, but the original was his biggest flop. Why do you think the audiences are embracing this show now? That's a great question. Yeah. I, I, I don't have any idea. I, to me, it's, it's funny because uh, I, I just read the script. I know there have been changes. And I know that the original production did some wacky stuff, like it cast, you know, ch children, really. Yeah, like teenagers, yeah. Yeah, and, and it also, uh, I know that lines have been changed. I know that things have been added and things have been cut. But yeah. I don't know what they are. All I know is this particular script. And yeah. I don't know why this script would be a flop. It's so good. It's so yeah. good. I couldn't agree more. It's funny too. Maybe we're not the right people for this question, but I, I, I'm similar. It's exactly what I was saying before. I only know this version of it and I know it has been reworked for many years. And this, this version is what, so Sondheim did this version with our director, 
Maria Friedman on the West End and Maria yeah. played Mary. This was, I don't know what year it was, but this was several years ago. And that is the version that we are doing. And, um, and it, for, from, from my perspective, this version just works beautifully. But I also have to say, I think Jonathan and Dan and Lindsay are a huge part of why this version is successful. I think that, and the, and the, chemistry that the three of them have because it is the story as in my view is a, is about the three of them yeah um it's a three-hander and it's so beautifully done and it and with jonathan at the core so i think because the three of them are such incredibly strong actors um everybody that that i ever talk to who sees the show they they talk about the the relaxed you know the, the, there's such a, a dynamic uh, trio because they seem so really so connected you know it's true i love hearing that i and that is what people say and and even just you know being with them on and off stage in the show they they are they are truly that they're thick as thieves i mean the yeah. three of them really are buddies and yeah and are um incredibly kind and and generous in the way that they lead the company and i think that has such a great effect on the company as a whole because it is such a trickle down um but i so i do i believe it's largely in part because of the three of them and yeah i think also I have to, you know, i'm going to change my answer i i do have an idea okay it's because of them <laughs> okay good you can't just steal my answer reg i i i, I whittled it down to just the core element <laughs> <laughs> I think it is them. I mean, also, but like the rest of the cast, I think we have a really incredible, I think that's what makes it such a perfect sort of production at this moment in time where each of us are in our lives and in our careers. We have this grouping right now that it just really works and it's cohesive. And I feel a part of that too. I feel like this has come at a perfect time in my life. I don't think I could have done this role or told this story the same way five years ago, you know. That's true. Also, there's a thing that has happened to me before. Um, uh, when you get, you know, we did it downtown and mm -hmm. then there's this time off. Yeah. Where it just cooks mm -hmm. inside you and you're not even do. you're not, you know, maybe, you, I mean, I thought about it a little bit, but I certainly didn't work on it. Oh, I totally. I just let it be in there and it just, got better sort of on its own i feel like it's just that time that time away mm -hmm. is it, it just lets it simmer for a while on its own it's so i'm so glad you brought that up i haven't talked to, about this with very many with jonathan and Lindsay. i've probably talked about it, but i haven't heard from you about it i i didn't even think about the show between off broadway and broadway it was really truly time away i took the kids down to see family in Texas. And I mean, we were, I, I wasn't even thinking about the show. And the minute we got back into the rehearsal room, it's like, it all just was yeah. still there. It was like the perfect amount of time away. Yeah. Okay. I know the, there it is. There it is. Okay. Merrily we roll along unfolds in reverse chronological order. How does that impact your approach to your character's arcs? Ooh, good one. Oh. Ooh. Reg, I love your arc. Will you tell, for people that don't know your arc, will you tell them a little bit about what your journey is in the show? Uh, well, he's a producer of theater and he's, you know, he's a, probably at the top of his game and he's got a secretary who winds up being Gussie Carnegie and uh, they fall in love. Deep, deep, deep love. I'm kidding. I'm, I'm, I think you do. I, love I, her funny, but I think definitely Joe does. Yes. Uh, and and they marry, and then he gets left for Frank. Mm -hmm. uh, and then, you know, I, I, we talked about this in rehearsal. I think again, I think a producer is a gambler. He's mm -hmm. a he's the guy who he takes a shot. He takes a long shot. He takes a, a easy shot, but he's always betting on something succeeding. Mm -hmm. Yeah, uh, she leaves him his 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 spidey sense just because of Spider-Man. That made me think of that. His spidey sense uh, gets worse, uh, slowly degenerative without Gussie there. And yeah. he starts probably gambling in real life, you know, and he's losing money and he's just falling down. He's he's not he's not doing good. 
but the show starts with him in that place. And then the backwards thing is what's great about that is I don't have to go to that place. Right. I come in at the beginning of the night and I do that scene. And from that point on, everything just gets better and better and better. Right. Till the end of the play, which the is scene you're talking about. Yeah. The scene you're talking about is you do such beautiful work in it and it's so small. Uh, it's just economically written, I think, but it is uh, really Joe at his lowest point asking yeah. Gussie for money yeah. while she's at an interview with, with Franklin Shepard. So for those of you that don't know that point in the show or haven't seen the show yet. And uh, so also we've not talked about this outside of it, but you also, uh, your character, it's alluded to that he's, he's become an alcoholic and that he's a real drinker. And I don't know how much that that plays into that for you at the end of I don't know. I'm not, I'm not actually sure where that is. I know that I know that Gussie says uh, just one Joe, as if he's drinking a lot. But uh, uh, I don't think he's, you know, I don't think that's his downfall. Right. Uh, Interesting. I think his downfall is more the loss of Gussie, really. mm. and I think that I exacerbates certain things. But I don't think prior to losing Gussie that he's, you know, in any way handicapped uh, yeah it's really her that, that starts the, the process down that, that was always my opinion yeah. because you know i mean there were times when when maria our director would would say in the uh jackie jackie and jackie scene mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. that i would i seemed a little drunk and i was like well that can't that's not that's not what's happening and that's not what I'm playing. So it was just, I think that I was sort of enjoying myself too much. Yeah. And I had to keep the eye of the producer because he's come there to see their show in order to decide whether or not to move forward with them as a writing team. And I, mm -hmm. and I really appreciated the note because I think I was just so excited that it right. seemed like he was drunk, but really he's just, and so I've tried to pare that down in the last, uh, that's so good. I never heard her say that to you. Um, yeah, well, it was present. Yeah, yeah, that's so um, great. Yeah. Um, there was another question up here. You can we can go ahead and move on to the next one. Unless do you, you want to, you want to say something about the the backwoods arc? Oh well, it's similar. I mean, we all it's it really is like a tragedy in reverse for all of our characters. Yeah. So you do meet us all kind of at our lowest points, which yeah. so mine is very similar. Um, so you start. You, you see Beth and Frank at the end of their marriage. So the first time you see my character enter, it is at their divorce court hearing. And it's very tragic. And I think what's beautiful about that scene for me is that you still get an opportunity to see that there's a genuine love between them and an, and, and, and a desire really deep down yeah, in both of them really to perfect. continue to, to make the marriage work. Yeah. Um, if circumstances were different. So I love to like, we get that sort of sad, difficult bit out of the way, and then we can kind of move on to the funnier, lighter things. It's actually a nice, yeah. it's a nice way to end the night because we leave feeling quite hopeful and on a high note, Yeah, or at least I do. I do too. Although I think audiences sometimes, they start by the end of the play, that by the end of, actual end of the actual play, they actually, they start, Yes. questioning their own choices and and they come out maybe not as hopeful sometimes yeah, sometimes. yeah. yeah. but i love your line uh, 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 i want us to that gets cut off by the kid coming in yes I wonder i always wonder where that's gonna go yeah i love that's my favorite part of the scene and it's such a tiny specific moment and i it's my favorite thing to do probably in the whole show is that moment where there's this tiny moment glimmer of hope for them yeah um, but that gets interrupted. Um, all right, I am gonna I'm gonna switch to another spot that's less now that everybody's out of the rooms. Yes. Okay, great. Okay, you both play the exes, two supportive, loving people who are jilted by ambitious spouses. So we don't really find out what happens to your characters. Where do you think they end up? Ooh, that's fun. I think you should take them. Well. I haven't really thought I, you, you know, that she, what we do know from the play is that she moves back to Houston. Her mom has, my mom has passed away and I take my son back to Houston and I live, I guess, close to my, so I can be close to my dad. 
Um, so I think that for Beth, I think she, her life uh, in New York is over uh, and she's re restarting in Houston where she's from. Um, and that is very sad because I do, I believe just kind of based on what happens in the show that she, anybody that's moved to New York, you kind of get, it, it's just a city of transplants, right? And it's, you just kind of create your own sort of New York family. And I think that's what they were. I think, you know, she has a relationship with Evelyn, who's Charlie's wife and their kids are, for, you know, so she sends, she sends her son up to New York to visit um, and to visit Charlie's kid. Charlie is um, Dan's character. So I think that is part of the sadness is that she loses that community, that sort of makeshift family that she has in New York and, and Mary, um, Lindsay's character. I mean, she kind of loses that friend group um, to some degree and her mom, you know, her mom has died. So I think that's, that's what I know based on what's in the script and it's kind of what, it's kind of what it is. I mean, I think she just has given up her dream to become an actress, which she did anyway to support Franklin. And, um, so yeah, I think she's a, some, she's a secretary <clears throat> of some kind is what she does to support a legal secretary. She's a legal secretary to support Franklin. She gives up her right. dream of becoming an actress. So yeah, I think she's. Well, I guess she's already sort of taken the, the leap. Yeah. You don't know. You don't hear. I. I don't hear. I've only really known one actress, who left. Angie, a girl named Angie Phillips. Did you know Angie Phillips? No. She left. She married a plumber in Florida, and she she left. She just, You've only she, known one actor. I know plenty of actresses that have I, left. I just, well, I mean, I don't, I guess I just don't really know that many people either. <laughs> <laughs> That's not why. But yeah. I know a lot of actresses that have decided to do something else and move on. It's hard. It must be a hard thing to, to, to give it up. But I think you've already sort of started by becoming a legal secretary. So you've already, you've already gone part way down that path. I it's also like the question of, I think, too, becoming a mom. It's such a, you know, she has a kid and she's, there's such a reality of, of that, I think, for her, um, what it means to be without work and without an income for a long stint of time. Right. I mean, I'm speaking right. probably from experience, but it is such a huge risk to take time away to have a family and to balance that. I, as a woman, that's like a huge uh, part of that's a huge part of how, what we have to think about when we want to have family yeah. um, is what that, what, how does that weigh in, how does that weigh in the balance of having a career? And, it, you know, so yeah, it is a very, it's, it's a tragic version of that story that yeah. has a really sad ending to that. And she does give up her dream. But the thing that I do love about Beth, I have to say she's, I think an understated sort of badass. I mean, she, this is like the late fifties and she moves from Houston by herself to New York city to pursue acting. And that's all takes a lot of nerve and a lot of gumption. And she does, she goes for it. And then she's on her own up there and she finds this friend group and she, you know, is she gets this gig performing at the downtown club with this man that she loves and all these, and these friends that she's made. And, yeah, I think she's just a real survivor, and I that's what I love about her. Yeah. What what do you what's your story? What happens to Joe? Oh, we we took mentioned it in rehearsal one time. I think that Joe oh. keeps trying to uh he keeps trying to find he thinks if he can just find the right vehicle for Gussie, that maybe he can just turn it all around. Oh I think that's what he's looking for. Honestly. That that is amazing. Oh, it just makes it even more tragic, Reg, just like how much your love for Gussie it, it informs every decision that you make as Joe. Yeah. Yeah. But it's like, look at, I mean, you know, we don't see their life prior, really, any of their lives prior. I mean, yeah. we sort of make it up, but, but he's a producer, you know, but so he must, you know, he probably goes to parties and stuff like that, but. This was a different thing. I mean, the, the feeling of being with uh, uh, with 
Gussie and Beth and Frank and Mary and Charlie. It's like he, he, it's like this is going to be this is going to be his life. Yeah. And the, the only chance we get is he already knows, you know, during the during the, the uh, apartment scene. And you're and you you've already left. But, you yeah. know, it's a hit. That's a great that's a great time. Yeah. And that's a great time point. for Joe. Yeah. Yeah. It's a high point for everybody. Yeah. I do love that moment in the apartment scene where you say you, you have like such an insight into what is really going on that even the characters don't know yet as far as calling Mary out on the fact that she's in love with Frank and you already knew about Gussie and Frank having the affair. And I mean, it's such a great moment for you as mm -hmm. Joe. Then the audience loves it. Good. <laughs> okay. Between the show's unconventional structure and Sondheim's brilliant, but verbose lyrics, Merrily We Roll Along is a challenging show to perform. Have there ever been any amusing mishaps? Have there? I think so. <laughs> I, you know, I don't. I don't have that much singing, so it's not. So the verbosity is not a, a problem for me. Uh, it's not as challenged. Joe is not as challenged by the music as everybody yes. else is. <clears throat> yeah. yeah, I guess I'm not as challenged. I mean. I think of opening doors and Franklin Shepard Inc. as far as for the verbose songs. Yeah, yeah. Um, but I mean, there are plenty of mishaps, but not about like missing lines or words and music. I mean, honestly, what I think is sort of a fun and exciting thing about the show as being in it, and also what I think I, our audience, the audiences, can experience is that there is a generally sort of it's almost like the lines are blurred between like the actor and the character a little yeah. bit. So you see a lot of just the, in, the very genuine and authentic interactions between us. The and Bobby, oftentimes- Bobby, Jackie and Jack is just a delight to watch for <laughs> that reason. Because you never know when you guys are laughing. What, like, what? What are, they, what, are, what are they laughing at? You know, because it's just stuff that just happened between you in the in the moment. Right. Is. Right. And it is that's and that's a really fun one because it's a show within a show. So any of that that's actually yeah. happening can be there and be yeah. present. So I think the audience gets let in a little bit on some of that not like fully like in a, you know, Carol Burnett show kind of way where you see them fully breaking character, but you do see, I mean, I think the audience does experience that with us almost every night where there's yeah. something, a little twinkle in somebody's eye that really catches on and, yeah. and they see a little bit of us just genuinely interacting with us a, a lot. They see a, throughout the entire play us genuinely interacting with each other. But yeah, Bobby, Jackie, Jack is definitely one. Last night was one where, I don't know if you did you notice us really cackling about so yes, I did. Dan's dresser does my quick change right before that number and she she had someone filling in for her yesterday so this other dresser was like rolling up my sleeves on my dress and I was feeling this is not normally is this rolled up and like right before the show the you know Bobby Jackie Jet the show within the show started we're upstage of the like mylar fringe curtain. And I look at Dan and Groff and I'm like, is this usually rolled up? And I have these like weird rolled up sleeves. So it felt really silly and like a football player. And then they were both like, I don't know, it looks different in their boys and they don't know. So I'm just sitting there like trying to like flatten them out. And every time I look at them, they're looking at my sleeves throughout the whole number and, you know, just silly things like that. But it doesn't really matter because we're supposed to just be like really silly and, yeah. you know, the show within the and show. You're, and you're winging it anyway, you know. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. So anyway, I do love that about this this show. Um, so nothing really, really huge not. mishappy, I guess. Okay. No, not really. Okay. Merrily We Roll Along is about friends growing up, growing apart, and compromising their dreams over the decades. If you could give your 20-year-old self one piece of advice, what would it be? Invest in Apple. <laughs> Good one. Uh, <clears throat> the only thing I thought of when I read that question is, is uh, uh, you, 
at, when you're trying to be an actor, you, you try, you keep wanting more, you keep, you're hunting down more. Mm -hmm. And the only, the, the real thing is you've got to remember to live where you are mm. and, and in the moment that, that you're in. Because I think about, uh, I was actually, my wife gave me a, a book for Christmas that is written by William Shatner. <laughs> oh, really? Yeah, and I was reading it and, and he talks, he was talking about that. He was talking about uh, when you go off on your own, when you leave your core family and you go off on your own, you're in search of this other thing, and uh, and they take they take the hit. Your family mm -hmm. takes the hit because they just don't see you as much anymore, and mm -hmm. they don't hear from you as much anymore. Mm -hmm. And it's like that's that's the advice I would give myself. Okay. And, Strangely, it came from Bill Shatner, but uh, <clears throat> it should be, you know, to write them more letters and to call them on the phone and to make sure they know what's going on and make them a part of it and stuff like that. I don't, yeah. You know, as opposed to just, uh, I need to get, I need to be more advanced than, than where I am, you know? Yeah. 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 I think it's still such a, I mean, I still, as far as being present and, just being kind of happy, you know, content and with where you are and owning kind of where you are. I struggle with that now. And I'm not definitely not in my twenties anymore, but I think, I think that's really also great advice. I mean, call your mothers. I pray that my mm -hmm. children still want to call me when they're out sort of in, in building their own lives, building their own careers and finding out who they are. Um, it's similar to, to what Frank says in the last scene, you know, he says, if I didn't have music, I'd die. And mm -hmm. then because he's hunting the next, as you go you know, from the beginning of the play, you see him wanting more and more and more, and he drops the thing that actually is the thing, the life force for him. And he does at the, at the beginning of the play. It's mm -hmm. only at the end of the play that you realize that maybe there is, maybe there is hope. But at the beginning of the play, he's, he is dead. Yeah, right. And that's the big question of like, is he, wh what is he going to do in this moment? The moment that we first meet him at the beginning of the play, which is the end of the story. But mm -hmm. he's just had this terrible party where he's realized he's kind of just lost everything, including who he, who he truly is, you know? And like, what is he going to do with that? Is he going to go, you know, reconnect with Mary and Charlie, or is he going to go jump off the GW bridge or whatever? You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Um, Sorry, that I didn't mean for that to be insensitive, but you know what I mean. How, he, that's how low he is. How hopeless, yes. probably. He's at, the, he's at the end of something. Yes, and he's lost everything. Yeah. Um, yeah, I think that's great. I don't know. I think now I can't get that out of my mind, but I guess I would have the uh, same advice for my 20 year old self. Also, you know, I. You are so fixated, you know, at that age too, um, and and I still feel like I'm. We're in Chris and I are in like this building sort of mode where we're still kind of in that in our careers and with our family, and it just is very busy, and you can get very caught up in that. Mm -hmm. Even though I think we both have a pretty good handle on what's truly important, I think you still it's so easy, especially in the city and in the industries that we're in, it's you can get caught up in the grind and the hustle and the uh yeah. Yeah, I think maybe advice for your twenty year year old self is probably advice that you should keep giving yourself every year. Yeah, I think that's true. But what is the next well let's do the next question. Okay, great. I could talk about that longer. Okay. You both have kids at home. How do you balance doing eight shows a week with parenting? <laughs> I'm a father. That's <laughs> how I do it. <laughs> you have an amazing wife. Yes. That's a very, very sweet answer. Well, it, it, it's the truth. She, mm -hmm. she does. I mean, I do stuff. Of course I do. Yeah. But it's usually when, <clears throat> when she needs me to do it because she doesn't have time <laughs> she doesn't mm -hmm. have time yeah well although I, I did she did a play she did all the way on broadway and she was in it in cambridge and when he was six months old i finished a little play at i don't know westport county playhouse or whatever that place is called yeah, yeah. and then i went to cambridge and i had the kid like for three months i had it or longer because then, then it went to Broadway. While she was in that show, I had him like every night, you know, 
uh, so I had I had a lot of time, but it is not the case anymore. Now it is now you know she, I'm a you know I'm a dad, so I have it easier than you do. <laughs> that's true of every. That's true of almost everybody. I think. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think you guys are good partners. You and Suzanne have, like are a good team. Yes. And that's how I feel, Chris and I. I mean, we are a really good team. And I mean, y'all saw him in the back picking up. And he's working. He's working too from home in his office. And um, he's in there getting Mabel from her nap. And bring, you know, we're shuffling around so we can both work from home and have the kids. And then our babysitter is going to pick up Eleanor from school. You know, it's just um, thankfully I'm I'm lucky enough to have to also have a really good partner and. And it's not always like this perfect 50-50 thing. I mean, sometimes he has to carry more of the load and then sometimes I do. And, um, you know, thankfully for me, you know, I'm, I go for long seasons without working full time. So I, I just am a full time mom, which can feel a little bit like whiplash when I'm like going from just being mom, you know, and doing all the things, you know, the behind the scenes sort of thankless things that yeah. mothers do. And then going and then, you know, being a working mom, which is, is also incredibly challenging. It's all hard. No matter what you do, being a parent, being a caregiver is hard. And yeah. um, it you do have to have support. And I think one thing I have learned in, you know, the six years that I've been a mom is, is how to, that I'm slowly still learning, I think, is how to have the right support to make sure that everything's taken care of. And I'm, I'm taking care of myself. I think I've, in the past sort of put myself last a little bit too much. And um, anyway, so now we're in the show and I have to actually take care of myself and make sure I have a voice and can get through the show eight times a week. So I do have a force to take care of myself, you know? Yeah. So, all right, next question. Oh, your best Daniel Radcliffe story. Wait, did you know Dan before the, before this? Yeah, we did it. We did a play at the public called oh, Crime yeah. And that, if I if I was going to tell a Dan Radcliffe story, that's that's what I would tell. He's a very special special character. That guy, he's uh, so good at everything he does. And uh, he we had just about uh, uh, basically it was done in London, and so it was different. They had to rewrite it for America, and it was about the NSA, and it was about the CIA, and it was about your phones, and it was about your computers, and your PlayStation is watching you, and the, and the, the just chips in the tags on your clothes. And so when you walk by a billboard, it, it advertises something that's similar to what you just bought so that, you know, they can, they, they're zeroing in on you. And we actually had hackers in the back of the, of the theater. And there would be somebody who bought a ticket and they used their email and they would call that person up on stage to do a, a speed dating thing with Dan's character. And they have, they got their email. So they went, they, broke into their Facebook and their Twitter and they got information. And then at intermission, they give Dan a sheet of like bullet points about the person that they were going to call from the audience who didn't know they were going to be called up from the audience. They were called up from the audience and Dan started saying, so I understand blah, blah, blah. And he had 15 minutes to look over this sheet of paper and he would, mem I don't know if he'd memorize it, but he'd just riff on the stuff they'd found about the person. And all of a sudden pictures are going up on the screen behind him of, of the, the girl on her Hawaiian vacation with her boyfriend. You know, I mean like it's, and, and he was so f the facility that he had with information is just, it's, he, he's amazing. And that's my Dan Radcliffe story. He's just, oh my God. I was hoping that was the story you were going to tell. You you had told me that story before, and it is so because I, I he's so dear on and off stage, and he's such a great guy. Um, that you know you just, I, I he's just so impressive. And I remember when you told me that story, I'm like, yeah, I mean, it is amazing. He is a, absolutely should be the you know, in the position that he, this, you know, he's this huge celebrity and he absolutely should be. He is, he is incredible. And I think what, I think audiences will really, are really responding to what he's doing in the show. Cause I think it's, I think what he's doing in our show is so different than anything he's done. And I think it's really, I mean, it's a testament to what, to his talent. I mean, he's really, he really is special. 
I don't really, I mean, I met him on this show and, you know, we just kind of connected over Great British Baking Show and, and parenting and, um, you know, and he's just kind of an easy person to get to know and get along with, which, you know, yeah, he, you know, is amazing um, for someone who's probably had to be somewhat guarded probably his whole life, you know. I would think so, yeah. I've never really asked him about that stuff, you know, because you don't want to, you know. You don't want to pry. Yeah. He talks, he talks about it a little bit, but yeah, most of the time. And, you know, most of the time we do talk about, you know, being parents and stuff because he just had, I don't know what his son is probably nine months old now. Yeah. Almost a year, I guess. Um, <clears throat> yeah. So we'll, uh, he'll, we'll talk about things like you know, sleep things and things going on with his son and sleep training, sleep training. And yeah. I had this, like, <laughs> I had this toy that was just kind of bulky and my kids have outgrown it, but I was like, I don't know, Daniel Radcliffe, do you want like a hand-me-down toy? I don't know. You could probably like, get your own toys for your kid, but I have this thing. Do you want it? And, you know, he's like, yeah, I love hand-me-downs. So, you know, I gave him this like, you know, it's one of those things that like Wiley can like pull himself up onto standing, you know, as he's kind of learning to, you know, start walking. He's probably walking soon, but yeah. And it's, a yeah, I'm going to wait. I'm going to wait till I give Dan a, a, a bullhorn. <laughs> A drum kit. A drum kit, yeah. <laughs> okay. What's the best deal you ever got at the TKTS booth, which celebrated its 50th anniversary last year? Wow. Well, happy anniversary, TKTS. Happy anniversary, TKTS. I Do you have a, a deal you got there? Um, no. I don't have a good story about that, but I've definitely, and that's how I've seen most of the shows that I've seen is because of going through TKTS. Yeah. I mean, Certainly before I was like in the, in, in the Broadway community and that was how I saw everything. I think when I'm not working, that's, that's what I do. Yeah. Because it's, it's hard to afford. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard to afford. Yeah. I was in, I came to New York as a, in high school. And I remember waiting in line at TKTS and the girl who I was with, she, she was an actress from my high school. And uh, some guy came up to her and said, are you an actress? And she said, yes, I am. You know, we were in high school. She was 17. I, oh, yes, I am. Oh, oh, I'm a producer. And, uh, and he started really putting the moves on. Her. Uh, and apparently it was a, a TKTS line. This is something that happened from time. Really? Yeah. Yeah. So the best deal she ever got was not, you know, calling him up and going to, <laughs> going to the studio. <laughs> oh my gosh. <clears throat> I remember the first time doing it, um, standing in line at TKTS. And I, I was up here, I guess I was in college and I, or maybe, yeah, I was probably in college and I, I, I got <coughs> to see Brian Stokes Mitchell and Mana La Mancha. Do you remember oh, that? Wow. I yeah. didn't see it. I didn't see it. Yeah. We had great seats. It was me and one of my girlfriends. It's one of the few plays that I know. I know Man oh. of La Mancha. I mean, one of the few musicals. musicals. And I know that I, I'm pretty sure I learned the meaning of the Bible by the eight track we had of Jesus Christ Superstar. So, really? I think so. Did your parents have like a lot of musicals around? Just that eight track of, of Jesus Christ Superstar. Wow. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Well, Eight track was a tape that was used in the olden days. Yes. I grew up on the sound of music. It was on VHS. It was a double cassette. Sure. And uh, yeah, I would like hop around the furniture as if I was Liesl in the, you know, in the gazebo. Singing I actually, my father had a pullover orange terry cloth robe and I would put on the eight track of Jesus Christ Superstar and play all the parts for my mother. Oh my God. That's so awesome. Do, do, the other one I did, which is probably not at all what people want to hear about, but the other one that I had as a kid was Peter Pan with Mary Martin. Uh, they did like a PBS recording of it. And I we just like recorded it on our VHS. So I still had to like fast forward through, I guess I had to fast forward through things, but I had a Peter Pan costume. Oh wow. And I would act it all out 
I don't know if anybody remember if anybody remembers it, then like the shadow puppets, like remember, do you remember this? I do, yeah. Yeah. And putting the shadow on with like soap. Oh, right, right, right. <laughs> remember that? Oh man. Okay, sorry, next question. <laughs> Did you ever read the book of Peter Pan? I mean the, the the play that it was based on? No. Oh, you should. Anyway, next question. All right, let's 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 be each other's casting directors. Oh, this I'm is the last question. This is the last question, people. <laughs> be each other's casting directors. What role would you put the other one in? I'm not good at this game. I actually just was thinking about it. Uh, 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 your physicality on stage is, I love it. I love oh. the way you use your hands. And, you know, I probably, because I like to use my hands as well. And, but yeah. you use your hands, you use your whole body. And, and, and plays that tend to not get a physical treatment are like Chekhov and Shakespeare. And yeah. I love putting physicality into those plays. It, it, oftentimes they're just talking heads. And I just think yeah. that you should be in Chekhov and Shakespeare. Just oh my God, like, like, Red. Crazy, like crazy Lady M or, or, or you're too young to play Ren of Skya, but you could play, you could, what are the daughters, Anya and, and, and Varya in, in Cherry Orchard? In those Cherry Orchard, yeah. Great plays. Oh my gosh, I take that as a huge compliment. I would love to do that. I haven't really had many odd opportunities to audition to think for things like that, I, you know. And then honestly, you know, I get I get told that I'm a little contemporary, probably because I'm a little too, I probably gesticulate too much. I disagree. Well, I appreciate that. It's just they, they think that because people think that because they just imagine everybody was stoic. Yeah, and that, that can't it can't be true. It can't be true. They're just human beings. I mean, that's how I approach most material. Is just you know, it's a human being and just this set of circumstances. Well, I haven't really. I don't know what I would say for you, but you've gotten to play a lot of very cool roles and like run the gamut. Like you have done Shakespeare and Chekhov, and and then you were the director. One of my friends just texted me a screenshot watching Friends, and it was one of your episodes where you played the director. Yeah. I played now, and that's I, I did that episode in 97, 96, and uh, those episodes. And I've been cast as directors and producers, just I've been typecast for the rest of my, rest <laughs> of my career. You were a director, you played a director in um, what was the, the last musical you did? Um, Tootsie. Tootsie, yeah, yeah, well, makes it easy, I guess. <laughs> and now you're a producer in our show. Yeah, yeah. Well, thank you, TDF fans. Thanks for joining us. Reg, thank you for talking to me. I love thank talking you, to Dave. you. I love talking with you. Thank you so much for asking me to do this. And thank you, TDF. And thank you, TDF fans. All right. Till next time. Bye-bye. <laughs>